Thanks everyone for joining us. We're just gonna give it another minute or so while people log in. Okay, we're at 65 participants uh, and all of our speakers are here. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today as we talk about business and human rights in light of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. My name is Tara Van Ho. I'm one of the co-directors of the Essex Business and Human Rights Project and one of the co-presidents of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association. Uh, I would say it's my pleasure to welcome you, but it's the circumstances that we're, we're meeting under are not the ones that I would prefer for us to be meeting under as we talk about business and human rights and situations of armed conflict. This is the first of two events. The second one is still to be confirmed in which we have an expert lineup of, or sorry, an excellent lineup of expert speakers talking about the current situation in Ukraine, what needs to happen when it comes to businesses responsibilities, as well as what we should be doing in the future, what lessons we need to take from Ukraine and what lessons Ukraine can take from other situations. Uh, I'm not going to speak for very long. You might be able to hear that I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize for my froggy voice. Um, I'm going to instead pass this immediately over to, to um, each of the speakers. I will introduce each of the speakers in turn uh, so that you can really focus on what their areas of expertise are as they're speaking. Um, our first speaker is Elena Ubarova. Um, Elena is the head of the International Lab on Business and Human Rights at Yaroslav Mudry National Law University in Kharkiv, Ukraine. Elena has repeatedly organized uh, sessions on business and human rights in Ukraine. She is one of the leading experts on business and human rights within Eastern Europe and is globally recognized for her expertise in the area. Elena is coming to us from Ukraine. And we, Elena, um, deeply appreciate your willingness to be a part of today. Uh, to say that Elena's leadership in this area is unparalleled is um, an understatement. Uh, and many of us have benefited from her leadership within Eastern Ukraine, both in terms of the lessons that she has brought to the global community, but also in terms of the personal connections that she has given us. Um, I, she brought me over to Kharkiv last year um, has brought, I know your name, Beata as well, as well as several others within the business and human rights community. Um, she, her work ethic is unparalleled um, and uh, she's a true pleasure to have within the field. Elena, I have given Elena the, the purview to do whatever she wants to talk about, whatever she wants to talk about. And from what I understand, it will be on business and human rights in Ukraine from an insider's perspective. So Elena, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Tata, and thank you for organizing this uh, event and thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I would like to share the slides and uh, some of you participated uh, uh, last week uh, in, in, in the event that was organized by um, Yaroslav Madri National University and Polish Institute for Human rights and business. Uh, I just want to repeat the two slides from that presentation because some uh, today participants um, uh, could not join us last week just for understanding the situation in Ukraine and the situation 
uh, is changing uh, and that's why just to give uh, uh, the whole picture that uh, we have today uh, and uh, in what situation, in what environment uh, business uh, is operating in Ukraine today. Um, you can see uh, the map of Ukraine and uh, just for understanding that uh, entire territory of Ukraine is uh, being um, attacked uh, by uh, Russian troops and uh, you can see that um, uh, very different places in Ukraine uh, were attacked. And uh, also uh, you can see that some territory of Ukraine uh, unfortunately is already uh, occupied uh, in some territory of Ukraine, uh, active military actions uh, um, continue now and the uh, rest territory of Ukraine um, is uh, quite calm, but uh, of course uh, all territory of Ukraine is in military state now. Uh, and um, over 3 million people have fled Ukraine for today, over 2.5 million Ukrainians are forcibly internationally displaced persons in Ukraine. And if we are talking about businesses, for, for example, European Business Association conducted survey about uh, uh, what actually uh, um, the reaction of uh, Ukrainian companies to the war and uh, we can share with you the link to their survey and uh, um, one more survey was conducted just um, two days ago and uh, we can see that of course uh, the economic situation in Ukraine is uh, quite complicated uh, and we can see that uh, more than 15 percent of Ukrainian companies have stopped uh, business in Ukraine now and uh, don't plan to restore uh, in uh, 2022 um, and a lot of small and medium enterprises have completely stopped their activities. Uh, Eight percent of companies are relocated significant part of their businesses outside um, of Ukraine and so on and so forth. And that's why uh, um, the key attention of Ukrainian government um, of course uh, is about how business will survive and uh, how uh, ukrainian government could support uh, business and uh, we conducted with yerni letnik cherny chambiata for Archik last year we conducted um, the study about business and human rights in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and uh, we concluded uh, at that time that the economy goes first in our region even in peaceful time uh, and uh, I should say that in war time uh, um, a lot of attention uh, uh, is paid uh, to economy as well and um, uh, responsible business conduct uh, is not uh, the focus uh, of attention of uh, uh, government. I don't want to criticize my state uh, in this uh, hard time, but uh, I want uh, to avoid some significant mistakes. And you can see, for example, uh, Prime Minister of Ukraine uh, and the President of Ukraine announced several days ago that business will get maximum free freedom and um, yesterday uh, some legislation uh, was adopted in Ukraine to liberalize uh, labor relations, uh, uh, to uh, with uh, maximum deregulation of business uh, um, and uh, President Zelensky said that we are cancelling all inspections for all businesses uh, to give them uh, opportunity to operate in this uh, highly complicated uh, environment. Um, and um, if we are talking about uh, uh, state obligation to protect, uh, um, you can see some references uh, to 
uh, UN Working Group uh, on Business and Human Rights report uh, from 20, uh, 2020 that um, conflict uh, uh, situation is the situation when states should require more from businesses than just respect for human rights. And uh, also uh, we uh, could uh, remind uh, John Raggi uh, report uh, from uh, 2011, Responsible Businesses Increase Seek Guidance from States uh, uh, on how uh, to conduct uh, in uh, difficult contexts. But uh, today um, in, in Ukraine, uh, at this moment, uh, we don't see any guidelines uh, how business uh, should uh, conduct um, in, in this uh, highly complicated uh, situation uh, in the context of responsible business conduct. Um, uh, just a few examples that could be considered as uh, uh, in the context of state obligation to protect. Um, we have a huge uh, problem with uh, cut payments, uh, for example, in Kharkiv, uh, uh, from very beginning uh, of uh, the war situation, uh, people can could not uh, could not use uh, uh, cards uh, to to buy food, to buy uh, drugs, uh, to buy anything just because uh, um, payment by cards uh, didn't uh, work. Uh, and now uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, trying to resolve this uh, problem and the responsibility for refusing to be able to pay by card will be increased. Uh, as I said, uh, um, labor relations uh, uh, will be regulated in a new way, uh, but uh, um, it, it should be analyzed in the context of business and human rights framework because uh, at the moment we can see just the draft uh, of uh, the new law. Uh, in, uh, it was uh, adopted by Ukrainian parliament yesterday, but uh, we didn't see yet uh, the officially published document, but um, the draft of uh, the law um, it's talking about um, six hours uh, per week, uh, not uh, 40 as uh, we had uh, before. Uh, in case uh, and many other norms uh, that uh, should be applied in war time and um, Ch th these norms uh, change in international standards, labor standards. Um, and for example, um, one of these norms uh, is um, saying that in case of impossibility to pay wages due to hostilities, uh, uh, pay payment, um, oh, sorry. Um, the payment of wages may be suspended until the enterprise uh, is able to carry out its main activities. And uh, the interesting uh, statement uh, is uh, the following, that um, reimbursement of wages, guarantees and compensation payments to employees uh, for the period of suspension of employment uh, contract is fully entrusted to the state which carries out military aggression. Um, so let, let's see what actually um, official interpretation of this um, provision uh, will be provided, but at the moment uh, we can see that uh, employees uh, should uh, require Russian Federation to reimburse uh, uh, the wages. It's a very uh, strange uh, provision at the moment. Um, and um, uh, also, uh, we have state regulation of uh, some key products uh, because uh, some uh, companies uh, 
uh, made prices of crucial uh, vital products uh, very high because of the war and uh, that's why Ukrainian government uh, gave um, the opportunity for regional military administrations uh, to control uh, prices. Uh, and also, um, I would like to pay attention to critical infrastructure in Ukraine um, because it's um, really um, uh, complicated situation uh, in Ukraine and some uh, cities, uh, especially uh, in particular occupied cities, uh, because um, companies. Uh, which provide uh, critical services and critical goods uh, could be used, uh, I would say, as a tool of, of uh, war today, because um, uh, actually uh, uh, power, uh, new power, uh, temporary power of uh, occupied territories uh, uh, requires uh, from such companies to stop uh, to provide uh, these uh, critical services and goods uh, if um, local population um, don't want uh, to support this new uh, power and that's why some cities uh, um, under the risk uh, uh, of a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I wanted to provide you with uh, some examples related to critical um, infrastructure in Ukraine in this time. Um, actually, um, uh, for example, uh, as I said in Kharkiv, from the first day of the war when the city was still quite uh, Calm, uh, uh, almost all pharmacies uh, uh, were closed. Uh, it creates a huge uh, problem to obtain medical goods uh, for residents. Uh, many food markets uh, were closed as well. It uh, caused the situation when people stayed alone lines uh, in the streets, uh, um, sometimes under risks uh, to be attacked uh, um, near very few food markets and pharmacies that were open and then local authorities asked uh, private pharmacies and private food markets uh, to open and to continue uh, their um, operations uh, just uh, to avoid the situation of humanitarian catastrophe because of lack of food, because of lack of, of drugs in these cities and so on. Um, uh, and I should say that all pharmacies and all food markets in Ukraine are private companies and, uh, um, and of course um, the owners of these businesses uh, should balance the safety of their employees. Uh, but also they should understand uh, that uh, the services that they provide are crucial, are vital for residents of, of these uh, territories. Um, and as I said also, in some occupied territories, if food markets and pharmacies stop operating, um, because they don't want to cooperate with uh, occupying authorities uh, or because they uh, don't want to conduct economic activities in the occupied territory. Um, in uh, many cases, it means for local residents uh, the absence of a chance to get food and drugs. Um, and I have, for example, uh, the city in southern Ukraine, Melitopol, uh, where um, occupying authorities can't provide uh, uh, food and drugs at the, at the moment for local residents. Uh, and if local businesses will stop to operate, it will really um, mean the humanitarian catastrophe for uh, this. Uh, city. Uh, some businesses uh, 
inflated uh, the price of services and goods a thousand time of times and as i said uh, the direction of state uh, of ukrainian state uh, was to provide regulation of uh, the price for crucial uh, goods uh, many uh, private uh, hospitals uh, were closed uh, in occupied territory and territories with the active military operations despite the um, fact that municipal and state-owned hospitals continue to operate. Um, uh, heating, water supply, utilities, in particular vast collection, electricity transmission and distribution, um, as I said, a weapon of war in Ukraine and um, uh, really in occupy, uh, especially in occupied territories, uh, the Russian military, in order to break uh, the resistance of the local population, uh, demands uh, to stop providing uh, these services from uh, companies, and many of these companies uh, are municipalities municipality owned companies um, and just some of these are private owned companies um, in many territories of ukraine from the very beginning of the war um, uh, we uh, had the problem with uh, cash payments as i said and uh, um, and this problem is still relevant, uh, very relevant for occupied territories again. Um, and this is the question uh, uh, for financial institutions, of course. So many of them in a private owned bank, some of them are state owned banks. Um, this is a very few examples uh, of the importance of responsible business conducts in time of war by companies that provided uh, critical services and goods. Uh, um, and we have the difference of this conduct uh, by uh, municipality owned and state owned companies from one side and private owned companies from other side. Uh, we have very um, good example of um, state owned companies railway company Supersalizinica, for example, more than uh, 600,000 uh, people were evacuated just from Kharkiv by this uh, company. Uh, and uh, of course, we need uh, recommendations, guidelines, regulations from a state or how companies should conduct at the moment the most responsible companies of course they uh, are trying to find uh, to develop uh, this uh, guidelines and standards themselves, uh, they um, are evacuating the employees, uh, they are trying to support, uh, to relocate employees and so on and so forth, but in general we have not such a general uh, framework uh, for uh, companies. Um, a lot of attention is paid uh, to transnational companies and to, to the question uh, which companies uh, stop uh, the operations uh, with or in uh, Russia. Um, but uh, a lack of attention is paid uh, to business, uh, responsible business conduct by Ukrainian companies. Uh, for, on one side, it could be, we, we can understand the situation, why we have such situation, but of course we need to, uh, to call a government to pay attention to this issue as well. Thanks, Elena. Um, thank you for anticipating my next statement. I really appreciated that overview, and it was a very comprehensive overview of what's going on within Ukraine right now, uh, particularly when it comes to Ukrainian businesses. We're going to come back to you in the Q&A. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to, to breathe now um, and hopefully relax as, you, as we try to help you work through some of these questions that you raised. I'm going to uh, invite Anina Ramasastri to join us uh, with her video. Oh, it is on. I just need to spotlight you, um, Anita. So, Anita, um, 
for those who don't know, Anita is one of the members of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. She has been serving for six years. We are a little heartbroken that she is stepping down. She's time limited out, so she has to step down. So, uh, but uh, it will be a loss to our community uh, to have you no longer on the working group. Um, Anita is also one of the co-presidents of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Associations, which is association, which is uh, co-hosting today's event. So Anita, um, you authored, or, or at least I should say the working group authored, but under your leadership and stewardship, uh, its report on business and human rights and situations of armed conflict. So I'm wondering if you could, uh, in light of what Elena has said, but also much more broadly looking at business and human rights in armed conflict, what do you think would be the top findings for what businesses should be doing in situations like Ukraine? Thank you so much, Tara, and thanks everyone. And Elena, thank you so much uh, for your uh, overview and for sharing with us insights from Ukraine. I just want to say that there are a variety of things here. This is a different situation that many that we, the working group and many of you as scholars have talked about where we often focus on, as Elena has spoken about, the site of the conflict where we need to focus on the roles and responsibilities of companies that may be there either deliberately or find themselves in the midst of conflict. And I know Mark Taylor will be speaking later, can speak much to that. The UN guiding principles speak about businesses needing to avoid causing, contributing, or being directly linked to human rights impacts. And of course, what the working group has said is that in areas of conflict, we have heightened risk of severe human rights abuses. And so therefore we need heightened or enhanced due diligence, which is a different kind of due diligence, trying to understand the drivers of conflict, where conflict is occurring and understanding that business activity is no longer just ordinary, but will lead to extraordinary and potentially devastating consequences. So in the area of conflict itself, businesses need to be aware that as they're operating, their connection to any combat or, or they're being engaged in any way, whether it's supplies, whether it's munitions, whether it's food, there may be a connection, there may be a cause or contribute. And so businesses have to think differently. Um, and, and again, as I said, I think we'll have other panelists speak to those issues. One of the biggest challenges that the business and human rights community has not focused on, so I thank Elena for addressing that, is of course the role of, of local national companies, small businesses that don't have an option to be in or out, but just are there and there are issues uh, around how can they continue uh, to, to, to operate when there is no option um, for exit um, and, and, and nor would they necessarily, should they or want to. Um, so I would just say that's a place that we, we need to do more is to provide guidance and understanding for, for that sector of businesses. I wanna focus though, of course, that this is an extended, extended geography. And what a lot of we've been focusing on is of course companies that have announced that they're cutting ties to Russia. I'll just mention there are several categories. One is, of course, if we use the guiding principles framework, it wasn't surprising to see large multinationals in certain key strategic sectors, let's say whether it's the aerospace sector with Boeing or oil and gas with companies like BP, seeing that there was a key relationship between the guiding principles, cause, contribute, and linkage, and their relationship to a government and the kinds of services and activities they're providing. So it wasn't surprising to hear them initially say that they were going to cut ties or that they were going to end certain kinds of relationships. This is the kind of action that we see in many other places in the world, most notably recently in Myanmar. There's a second group that uh, have followed suit, and these are companies providing services to people, ordinary consumers. These are the McDonald's, the Starbucks. The guiding principles, I just want to say, don't initially say that those companies need to leave or divest because, again, they need to look at linkage. One of the key messages back to that sector of businesses is that they do need to engage in heightened due diligence now. Some of that is around if they stay, what does that mean? The nature of their business relationships to key entities and people like oligarchs that are under sanction, right? How is their operating and the revenues they're generating providing a linkage to that larger economic engine? And, 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 and what should that calculus be and if the decision is to stay, what are the mitigating measures? And we've seen some of that in terms of profits not being paid in, but being repatriated as, and, and given to relief efforts and so forth. You know, Uniqlo is staying, McDonald's is going, right? So we're seeing different calculus. And a company like a pharmaceutical company may specifically say we're staying because we are providing a different kind of service. 
again, we, we will all have different views as to what that should be, but it's just to say the guiding principles say, uh, look at your, your situation, look at your leverage, but look at where you are connected to the harm and then move from there in terms of heightened due diligence. I'll say that the bigger challenge, and this is what I wanted to focus on, is that we actually have to move outside of Russia. And this is the part that we have ignored, which is that there are a large number of entities, whether they are law, law firms or financial institutions or even uh, companies that have strong ties actually and linkage back to individuals that are under sanction or to critical parts of the economy. And those entities, much some time ago, but certainly now, have the obligation through their heightened due diligence to, to think about what they're going to do in terms of, of the ties and activities that they have. They are the ones that have acted the most slowly. They are the ones that are now coming under the spotlight, but much, much more can be done. So I would say again, as we look at cause, contribute, and linkage, one of the key things that business entities have to look at now is the business relationship, right? And that the business relationship is no longer an ordinary one, that there are businesses and people under sanction or who are somehow in that circle of influence. And so if there's now a connection, there then becomes an obligation through the guiding principles to act, right? And finally, if there is an impact to individuals to mitigate, you can do that by removing people from your boards, by exiting, but then thinking about employees that you leave behind. So I'll stop there just to say the guiding principles provide a tool and a framework for an affirmative, proactive decision making. And I think the big lesson for companies now is that this should have happened in terms of having frameworks and approaches to these issues that, that led to better decision making um, when these crises and, and these conflicts occur. Thanks, Anita. We're going to keep coming back to this issue of what businesses should be doing as they leave Russia. Um, I know we're going to come back to it a little bit with your name as well. But I've been a little disturbed by simultaneously how quickly businesses have left Russia, how few of them are referencing human rights, and how few of them are doing it in a human rights compatible way, right? So, can I just give you 30 seconds on that, Tara? Yes, right, which is that, exactly, I've been now, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm I'm tracking. So one of the things I'm trying to do now is put together a really comprehensive list of companies and what the responses are and what their stated rationale is. And if you dig d deeper, it isn't human rights. It often is that the risk of doing business has become much higher, right? Insurance risks, security risks, logistic problems. So that while it may seem that this is a just, sometimes it's just a sort of quick reaction, right? That we need to do this and, and, and the CEO or the board acts. But very often there's an underlying economic consequence that's driving this, not the guiding principles. Yeah, and it's been a little disturbing to see how how quickly the human rights angles of this and, and the implications of this leaving is is just being set aside, right? So I'm I'm going to for I think perhaps the first time in my life since I was like eight years old and loved a Big Mac, but like I'm gonna praise McDonald's here because they at least have said that they're going to pay their employees for a certain amount of time. Um, but a lot of other businesses have left without thinking through the implications, the human rights implications, either in Ukraine or in Russia of what they're doing. And I think that that's a really disturbing trend that we're seeing. And I think the fact that human rights isn't featuring in their rationale is seeping through, not just how quickly they're leaving, but every other aspect of how they're handling this. Call your bank, Tara, make sure and ask them what they have done and are doing um, uh, about this. I'm gonna note that our pension fund has decided to cut and run from Russia. Um, we've been actually campaigning for that for a very long time for human rights and environmental considerations. We've been asking for them to divest from fossil fuels more generally, and it took this before they decided to do that, which is deeply disturbing. We're going to move from one working group to another, and I'm going to ask Alina Abarek to turn her uh, camera on. She might already be on. I might need to um, let me add a spotlight to her, and I'm going to remove Anita's. Um, so Elena is a member of the UN Working Group on Mercenaries, uh, which also has been looking significantly at the issue of private military security companies, which has been a significant in this context. So Elena, there have been a lot of allegations of mercenaries being hired to go into Ukraine. Um, at one point, the, the, the company Wagner was, was named as having, uh, been asked to target Zelensky. They have said that it's not them, that it's other mercenaries who are doing this. 
Um, but the term mercenary has a very specific legal meaning and implications. So can you first walk us through that distinction between private military and security companies and mercenaries and why that difference matters here? Sure. Thank you, Tara. And hello to everybody. And thank you uh, for convening this uh, meeting. I think it's very important to discuss uh, quite a lot of different aspects of business and human rights uh, in armed conflict because it, it does create a complicated uh, situation for people, for human rights, for humanitarian law, so for businesses. And let me start by saying something that I think is very important. Um, war is the business. And it is in fact, one of the most profitable business in history of humanity. And at the same time, this is also the context where the gravest human rights abuses take place. And it also the most challenging for the fact finding or any criminal investigations. So I am not able to talk more uh, in detail about the current uh, situation in Ukraine because the working group is still monitoring the situation and we have not yet made any public uh, statement in regards to the actors on their mandate. But I can say that the working group on the use of mercenaries has actually visited Ukraine in March 2016. And it's very interesting that in our press release from that time, the colleagues who were conducting the visit declared, and I quote, foreign armed actors range from volunteers to paid servicemen and women, and from independent militia members to professional military. And these reportedly include large numbers from the Russian Federation, Serbia, Belarus, France, and Italy, among others. These actors, as our colleagues said at that time, reportedly were serving with armed groups of self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic, and also the self-proclaimed Luhansk People's Republic and in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. And of course, here we have to read the status as determined by the UN General Assembly Resolution 68-262 on the, on the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So as you see, this was 2016 and the and situation has most likely not involved too much uh, in terms of different relationship with different non-state actors uh, and state actors. Today, we are currently uh, assisting three armed conflicts that are taking place in Ukraine at the parallel time. So since 2014, there is non-international armed conflict on the east side, as Olena presented very well in her presentation in the first uh, slide. And that involves non-international uh, self-proclaimed People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk in eastern Ukraine. And there is also, since 2014, the military occupation by Russia as Olena also well, well presented, and that is the occupying part of the Ukrainian territory, Crimea and Sevastopol. And again, to be read through the lenses of the UN General, um, General Assembly resolution. And of course, as you're all very well aware, since, to, uh, since February this year, there is international armed conflict. That means that international humanitarian law applies in those situations in different ways, in different conflicts, as well as human rights law. And some things have to be uh, clarified from the beginning. International humanitarian law is lex specialis and therefore has the priority over human rights law in terms of conflict. If there is a conflictual norm, that is international humanitarian law prevails. That's one important aspect. The second important aspect when it comes to international humanitarian law is that it does apply directly to non-state actors, including companies. Whereas human rights law, as we all know, does not necessarily apply to directly to, to companies, and there's still a lot of debate in that. H international human humanitarian law does in fact apply. Now, the international humanitarian law uh, applies, there, and when we come to talk about the, the international legal framework on mercenaries and PMCs, it factually and legally is very complicated right now in Ukraine. So mercenaries are defined by three international uh, legal instruments the Article 47 of the Additional Protocol 1 that applies to the occupied territory and to the international uh, um, conflict between Russia and Ukraine taking place. It does not apply in the non-international armed conflict taking place on the eastern part of the Ukraine. There is also the UN definition uh, or UN instrument on mercenaries that applies to the whole territory, to Ukraine and to the Russia and it provides the legal uh, binding definition of what is mercenary. The private military and security companies are not defined by any international legal framework. Uh, they, there is currently discussions with the intergovernmental working group, but it is yet to be seen how that's going to evolve, whether there is going to be um, 
any uh, uh, international legally binding uh, normative framework adopted and what would be the content. And there is uh, the session taking place in April this year uh, on, on that to continue discussions. So uh, we have mercenaries that can be defined in one part uh, where they cannot be defined in other parts. They could be foreign fighters, which are not legally defined and that they are PMCs, all of which fall within the, the mandate of the working group on the, on the use of mercenaries. And it's, it's very important to say that private military and security companies, while they are not defined, they well may operate uh, providing different services, including as humanitarian actors or uh, supporting humanitarian actors, supporting states, supporting other companies like, ex, uh, like uh, tech, tech companies or supporting the services of uh, protecting banks, etc. Um, but from the moment that the personnel of private military and security companies does participate in, in, in hostilities, they could potentially fall within the definition of mercenaries. And then, of course, they're, and that's regardless of how they name themselves, whether they are just a security provider or military uh, services. And then, of course, between mercenaries and PMCs, we have what we have under our mandate is mercenary related actors. And as you mentioned, Tara, in that category, we very often situated Wagner Group because they don't seem to have a legal existence. They don't seem to be registered legally in any country. Um, and they seem to be operating in, in several conflict zones as we identify them in Central African Republic, in Libya, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And they can be qualified in some instances as as uh, mercenaries. Um, and the fact with them is that is problematic because they don't have the legal existence. It's really hard to identify them. What comes very common to all of them is the obscurity about their relationships, about their actions and activities taking place in the armed conflict. And as I said again, uh, the transparency around their, their actions and human rights abuses uh, leads very often to, to total impunity of those actors. And this is one of the issues that we are facing. Uh, as, as the working group said already in 2016, there is a total lack of accountability. Uh, those accountability from 2016 have not yet taken place. And uh, it is something that we regularly uh, identify in different contexts. And it, it comes as a, as a concerning factor in armed conflicts. And I'll stop here for, for the moment. Thanks, actually, Elena, before you leave us, or not really leave us, but um, before you turn your camera off. Um, when it comes, because you mentioned a few things that, that I think are really important. First of all, the nuance between what kinds of actors we're talking about is a lot more nuanced than what we're seeing play out in the media. Um, and there are significant implications there. Um, I'm going to ask you really quickly, what do you think should home states be doing in this situation? I realize Wagner doesn't have a home state or it has a lot of home states. We're not really sure. Um, I tried to figure out what they were and gave up because I knew I would have you here to educate us. Um, what should they be paying attention to? And what are sort of the top things that we need to be looking at when we're looking at PSMCs uh, working within, within Ukraine? Well, first of all, when, when we talk about legitimate uh, private military and security companies, regardless how, of how they name themselves, their character, their activities can, can change in the time of the conflict. To give you an example, a company can be a security provider in, in a peaceful city somewhere in Europe, but have a unit that will provide security to humanitarian actors in a conflict zone. And that unit might actually uh, participate directly in hostilities or becoming even um, under a mercenary, mercenary related actor. That is one problem. And so there is a risk for those companies to be actually falling within the definition of mercenaries and potentially be criminalized for those actions. The other problem, and, and that's something that we see regularly in modern conflicts around the world, is the relationship, the blurring lines between uh, armed conflicts, organized crime, and private military and security uh, companies operating, uh, or business in general, uh, business-related crimes. And, and, and that's something that happens I'm writing a publication on the, on the lessons learned from the Yugoslavia, the international sanctions that stroke Serbia at that time, over 100 resolutions, created the biggest hyperinflation in Serbia that provoked organized crime. Because as I said, this is really important, war is business and you need money to conduct war. So one way or another, 
you will find yourself conducting uh, some kind of economic activities. If those cannot be legal, illegal, they will become illegal because you want to win the war. And then, of course, there is, the, and I'm going to start with that. Um, I presented the report to the Human Rights Council in September, which I think is very uh, striking now, illustrated as we talk about Ukraine, regretfully. Um, the role of private military and security companies supporting humanitarian actors, but also presenting themselves as a humanitarian actor. And that uh, we have seen in some cases where they say, well, you know, we are humanitarian actors, we're providing humanitarian services, which, which is extremely frightening and concerning because it's blurring the lines between who is civilian, who is military, who is military, who is humanitarian actor, and of course creates confusion on legitimate targets, and of course on the, the legitimacy of the real humanitarian actors providing services. And of course, on the other hand, those who can afford security will be protected by those uh, private security humanitarian actors, as they say. So these are the real risks that at least for the private military and security, for generally security sector that needs to be taken into account. Thanks, Juliana. And I'm just going to note for everyone that that these considerations around the PS, PMSCs and, and security providers generally are not just for the initial security industry, but also for the other industries that, as Juliana said, rely on them to provide security and services while they're operating in country. So if we go back to what Anita said around cost contributing directly linked to those businesses that are hiring these, these actors, need to be really conscious of what these div divisions are and how they are using their security uh, companies within the country and what those security companies are doing both on their own and, and on behalf of the company uh, when it comes to blurring those lines. So thank you, Yelena, for that. Um, I should have said this at the beginning and forgot. Um, I am going to bring Beata Fair to check in, but also just to note that we do have a Q&A open. Please use that instead of the chat if you have any questions. Um, we're going to go through our speakers, but, but I am going to try to integrate questions as I see them uh, pop up. So Beata, um, let me, ah, there you are. Um, so Beata, uh, Beata Fair is uh, the co-president and founder. Wait, I think I just messed up your title, I'm sorry. Uh, she is the co-founder and president of the board of the Polish Institute for Human Rights and Business. Um, I have to say that, that uh, so Beata, Yerne, and Elena are currently editing the special issue on regional views from Central and Eastern Europe for the Business and Human Rights Journal. Um, and I, I have to say that today has been a, a real pleasure for me because I get to bring together three of, I mean, with Elena, it's also four of my favorite people from business and human rights within Eastern and Central Europe uh, to talk about what has started off at least as a very regional experience um, and, and one that, that has a lot of heavy regional implications. Um, so we have seen Beata some leadership from several states in the region. This includes Poland, Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania when it comes to galvanizing international condemnation against the invasion. We've also seen a lot of sanctions, but we have not heard a lot from home states, including any of those states that I just listed, about the responsibility of businesses uh, when they're operating within, within Ukraine or, or within Russia, um, particularly with regards to businesses' independent responsibility to respect human rights. So I want to start with you in terms of what should we be expecting from home states in this situation? Very much, Tara, and many thanks for the introduction, and thank you as well for invitation to join today's session and uh, such fantastic panel of experts. I just wish we had slightly different um, reason for that. Um, you know, in Poland, we have this saying that you should prepare for the war at the time of peace. And kind of from this business and human rights perspective, um, when I was thinking about our session today, I was just just was so clear is that so many states have developed national action plans and that some considerations to situations of conflict of armed conflict should be already um, should already find their uh, place there and um, having looked at several um, maps I have to say that I am very disappointed because I mean indeed we do find in maps different uh, provisions or references to how to operate um, 
you know, uh, the due diligence guidance for responsible supply chains of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas, but there is very little um, in NAPS, if at all, um, of consideration given to areas affected by ongoing conflict or under occupation. And um, there are some countries like Slovenia, which kind of states very clearly that uh, in such situations, it provides only humanitarian aid in form of donations to international organizations, but it appeals to electors to involved in co conflict to respect humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law. We've got countries like Poland, which barely mentions any uh, anything of relevance to such situation, except for stating that, yes, um, cor corporations operating uh, in Poland or abroad should respect human rights and they should pay particular um, regard to the situation in armed conflicts. But, you know, this is hardly <laughs> much of the guidance. Um, we do see some of the references to the OECD risk governance tool for multinational enterprises in weak um, governance zones, but we don't really see much beyond that. We don't see, I mean, we, we just kind of find those very, I mean, much needed, but quite cozy references to some of the international standards and it basically stops there. Um, in France, uh, kind of the most concrete uh, sections that I found, which kind of looks ahead kind of you know, trying to address the issues that might be coming up is the Czech National Action Plan, which actually has a very concrete section on uh, trade in military equipment, where it kind of establishes um, some regular meetings between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and industry um, and trade and NGOs to discuss issues on transparency and human rights in trade and military equipment, and um, also regular assessments that are to be carried out um, of the human rights risk posed by expert licenses and by military equipment experts that have been made. So it's kind of like the only proactive um, really section that has relevance to the armed conflict. Um, in case of, uh, for example, I was actually quite surprised by French National Action Plan, which kind of carries a number of conflict related provisions, not perhaps very substantive, but, um, but still. And there is one um, statement that under actions currently underway that MFA and international, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Devel Development issues, issues advice for businesses operating in conflict zones and or high risk areas. So I didn't have possibility to check if this was really issued, but at the same time, I bear in mind that on the 4th of March, so just, you know, uh, slightly over a week ago, um, we had uh, Le Figaro reporting that actually Macron has met with 15 largest French businesses and that the message passed was basically, um, you know, don't rush with moving out of Russia until you talk to us, because if you leave, the Chinese will come. So, you know, I'm just kind of a little bit worried about the guidance that might be given and, you know, um, you know, maybe during those discussions, human rights will be discussed, but I fear that that's not necessarily the main concern. So um, even though I would expect very clear guidance from the states to the companies that are um, operating under its jurisdiction, um, at the same time, trying to be realistic as to what sort of guidance this could be. Still, it is something that would be very, very needed. Um, However, what also states can do, and just kind of talking from the Polish and probably a number of neighboring countries to Ukraine at the moment, I think what our states can do is to also try to ensure um, that the regulatory framework in our countries is at the moment, or at least is getting switched to the current situation, and that we have provisions that will enable businesses that, um, you know, some of the businessmen or individual um, also um, enterprises which will decide to move to Poland or other countries to operate under the same conditions as uh, the normal operations, because at the moment there is simply no time for lengthy registration procedures. And with the flux of refugees from Ukraine, I mean, we need to have the space for them to be able to operate and not wait for half a year or longer um, because of how the current, kind of the previous procedures, um, because that was the time under the previous procedures. Since basically today we have a new law in force, kind of the so special law, 
uh, which opened the Polish markets to both, um, just basically opened lab Polish labor markets to Ukrainian refugees. It opened also, uh, it enabled establishment of the companies. It basically relieved um, refugees as well as uh, companies from Ukraine from paying any income taxes in Poland on what will be, um, what they will earn across the next, uh, I think, 18 months and so on. So I think kind of looking at those frameworks and at the same time ensuring that there are a number of inspections that at the same time control not only this new business, but also Polish business, because a number of Polish companies were operating in a, uh, responded fantastically. Um, but, and we might be able to talk about that later, but also we do have, of course, unfortunately cases where people are inflating prices, charging some really horrendous money to people who are fleeing war. And there was already some reaction from the state to stop it and to, uh, to find such um, situations. So I think this, the role of state is dual. On one hand, it's kind of providing clear guidance what the companies that kind of carried operations in Ukraine should be doing, what the companies that are engaged in Russia should be doing, or what steps they should be undertaking to ensure that they do not cause any additional harm. But also there is this importance of reacting swiftly within their own territory and making sure that um, this territory is safe for people who are coming here. And here we see a set, we've got some legislation, not everything is as it should be also in terms of ensuring frameworks for preventing human trafficking, because this seems to be left totally uncontrolled. And um, we see some movement around that, uh, unfortunately as well. So I think there is what states also should be doing is creating frameworks that will enable safe either self-stay or passage through the Polish territory if people want to go to another countries, but in a way that is really controlled because at the moment, a number of people are just kind of meeting with people, you know, who drive buses at the border and, you know, they are shouting names, okay, I'm going to Berlin, who wants to go with me? And, you know, it can be a very good person, but it can be just a group of um, human traffickers. So um, yeah, some more responsible, and coordinated efforts should be established around those issues. Many thanks. Thanks, Viada. Um, I wanna pull together something that, that kind of came out in both yours and Anita's comments, which is that really the steps to where we are now should have been put in place a really long time ago. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna um, spend too much time thinking of the what, what should have been. But I do think that one of the lessons that needs to come out of this is the signs and the and the sable rattling at least was there for long enough that we should have been expecting home states and businesses to really put in place measures that make sense um, that can be really implemented when when the conflict does erupt. And the fact that that hasn't taken place either from the businesses or from the states is, is leaving us in the same governance accountability gap that we've had throughout the business and human rights history. Um, and I think it's just a little frustrating for those of us who've been feeling like we're screaming into the wind um, on, on business and human rights and our conflict to be back at this place again, where you have the French government. The French have historically been one of the angels within business and human rights, the first to adopt a duty of vigilance law, you know, that actually has effective remedies in it. And, and now you have them saying to companies, coordinate with us before you leave so that we don't open up for other nefarious businesses to come in. Um, or, or I don't wanna say that all Chinese companies are nefarious businesses. He was thinking about it in political terms. I was thinking about it in terms of human rights, that if ethical companies leave, non-ethical ones will enter, but I don't think that that's really the, the appropriate um, the appropriate remit. You you briefly raised your hand, so I want to give you a chance. Yeah, I just want to, no, I just wanted to react. I mean, I don't want to, uh, to come across, I mean, uh, perhaps wrongly. I mean, I do understand and I really do appreciate that the government kind of wants to liaise with Let's business because it is necessary how, you know, how else it can provide guidance. Uh, kind of my main concern is that the messages that at least got across to the press is that, you know, human rights are kind of somewhere down the list and that's not necessarily the concern that could be taken into account. So it's okay to consult. 
Yeah, it's deeply, deeply troubling. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later, probably with a few more questions, but I'm, bring, I'm going to bring your name right now, Chernik, in. Uh, your name is, I think it's just the three of you um, who are doing the uh, coordination of this, um, or the editing, guest editing, sorry. Um, guest editing of the Business and Human Rights Journal special issue on Central and Eastern European experiences and views. Um, I always have to read your names uh, where he's actually at in Slovenia because it's a very long title for his university. So uh, your name is a professor of constitutional and human rights law for the Faculty of Government and European Studies at the new university in Slovenia. And, and, um, and uh, we've, we've known each other for 10 or longer years. Um, and in that time, you've always been based at the same university and I can still never <laughs> say it correctly. I always wanna flip around the, the European studies portion. So apologies for that. Um, Irene, uh, I've already said up front that, that we've brought together some of the leading experts on business and human rights within Central and Eastern Europe. That is your name. Um, and they have helped set up and establish the Eastern European Regional Group or um, Regional Collective uh, Network of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association. And your name has been helping to do that and has long been a leader um, and a leading voice within, within the field. Uh, so your name, we have seen a mass exodus of businesses from Russia. We've discussed that already a little bit, but some of this is clearly in response to sanctions, some in response to public pressure. And again, we are very rarely seeing a discussion of human rights. You wrote about divestment from Russia in a blog post on the Business and Human Rights Journal's blog. You noted that the Russian market is likely to look to India, China, and elsewhere to fill the gap. It's the same concern that apparently Macron's government communicated to the French businesses. So is divestment the right answer here and why or why not? Hi, Terry. Hi, everybody. It's uh, good to be here. I also echo your, your uh, earlier comment that uh, perhaps <laughs> it would be nicer to talk about uh, some other pertinent issue, perhaps uh, about the proposal for EU uh, Sustainability Directive. Uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, Beate and Olena and I, we have in the past uh, years tried to bring attention you know, to, to business and human rights in Central Eastern Europe and also Central Asia. Uh, there has not been much you know, focus uh, on that. Uh, fortunately, uh, that aggression perhaps uh, you know, brought the focus uh, to the region. You're right, uh, we are currently co-editing the special issue of BHR journal together also with uh, Rutvica Andrišević of uh, University of Bristol. She is also one of the co-editors of special uh, special issue. But right, uh, this investment uh, has been uh, has been seen the last week since uh, February 24th. But uh, in order to understand this investment, one ha has to go deeper. You know, uh, one has to go back into the context and the history of economies of Central East European countries, particularly of uh, Russian uh, Russian Federation, because. One, one question which I often get uh, in the last uh, two, week, two weeks is, well, if uh, those Western companies are now dis disinvesting and disengaging from the Russian market, well, what did they have thought uh, before the, when they decided to invest in, into the into Russian market? We all know that uh, investment in Russian market, but also in other parts of Eastern Europe has been considered by financial institutions as riskier, as uh, investing in the UK, US or German market. And uh, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that, uh, you know, Russian economy has uh, been very much uh, state planned. You know, still state has a large part uh, in the economy. There, there are different assessment of, about the share, but they go from 40 to 50%. So in order to invest into, into Russian market, one has to, you know, uh, has to do a uh, different different uh, assessment and different uh, you know uh, diligence uh, before the company decides to, to invest. Mostly, it has to do with uh, you know rule of rule of challenges. You know, uh, uh, in the Russian market, but also in other parts of Eastern Europe, uh, the way of doing business has been so far a bit different than in the more developed 
economies, uh, there was uh, always a lot of meddling of uh, politics, uh, politicians. Uh, uh, perhaps Russia is a prime example of that. We just uh, have to remember what happened to Mr. Khodorovsky, you know, formerly one of the richest uh, businessmen in Russia. But then once uh, uh, Mr. Putin took over, uh, he in a couple of years lost uh, er almost everything what uh, he had, uh, he ended up in the prison. Later, he, he won uh, cases before the European Court of Human, uh, Human Rights, but those you know, wins were uh, uh, symbolic uh, at best. So there, there always has been a you know, collision between state and private interests and every company which you know, decided to invest in, in Russia, it had to deal with uh, politicians, both at local, regional and uh, state, uh, state uh, level. Now, for example, we are uh, witnessing one of the first companies to disinvest from Russia was BP, British uh, Petroleum. And BP for many years had a, a big share in uh, one of the largest state-owned companies in Russia called uh, Rusnet, uh, about 20%. 20, 20%. Of course, the, the question again is why BP in the first place decided to invest in Russia, if uh, the board was aware of challenges concerning rule of law, you know, and uh, lack of stability and the predictability of of investments, protection of um, uh, of uh, investment, so th those are those are the issues one has to have in the account when assessing the disinvestment of companies, uh, which we are seeing since uh, February twenty twenty fourth. And uh, what we are seeing is that particularly Western companies have been disengaging and disinvestment, uh, disinvesting from, from Russian uh, market. It seems from this disinvestment and disengagement that those companies, uh, at least they thought they don't have any leverage you know, to stay in Russia. You know, they didn't have any, uh, any uh, influence to, to bring about positive change at the Russian market. So that's why uh, uh, they decided to, to leave. That could be one uh, interpretation. And of course, uh, uh, I think uh, would be too optimistic to ascribe the reasons for their, their disengagement uh, to do business in human rights. Most of this disengagement and disinvestment is uh, purely uh, self self interest, uh, uh, going back to rule law issues uh, back in their home jurisdictions, either in the EU, UK, or US, uh, threat of sanctions and being connected in this web of. Uh, sanctions, but also rule of law issues in, in Russia. We heard uh, pronouncement by the Russian government that it will, it will nationalize, that it will freeze uh, the investment of all companies uh, which, uh, uh, which, have, uh, which have left. Uh, uh, those were the main, the main reasons uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, disinvestment. And of course, when one, uh, one uh, takes everything into, into consideration, one asks, uh, well, why did these companies disinvest? You know, uh, because they knew where they were coming even before the start of uh, uh, aggression. Uh, perhaps uh, they wanted to protect the employees or the larger communities, or they, uh, you know, they were appalled because of the human rights uh, violations here. Uh, I agree with Anita uh, and also Robert uh, wrote in the comments. Uh, that uh, human rights uh, usually is not the issue, which companies uh, you know highlight in their in their statements. Uh, for some reason, uh, from the statements which I researched and and gathered and analyzed in the last uh, few days and uh, and weeks, uh, a lot of companies uh, talks about violence, you know, uh, violence occurring. You know, it's very hard to. To, to, to see human rights language, you know, human rights abuses, uh, human rights um, uh, violations. And of course, uh, when, uh, when we, we talk about uh, the future, now you asked me about the future, where could the Russian Federation turn to, or where could the Russian companies turn to? The answer is not, uh, it's not simple. No? Russian economy is not the largest in Europe, it's one of the largest, I think, four to 15 uh, uh, in Europe, but it's very much embedded in the in the European uh, European market, most of export of Russian federations go to uh, go to Europe. Uh, you know, mostly oil, uh, oil and gas. Here again, you know, we are coming to to the reasons why Europe engaged with Russia. You know, in the past, uh, we all remember Nord Stream One. You know, started 
in uh, 2011, uh, more than 10 years, 10 years uh, ago. So most, most of their exports are uh, in the European market, about 40 40% 40 uh, export to Chinese market, uh, about they're about 13, 14% to India, even less, I think a couple, couple percent. So the, you know, the switch will be very difficult for, for Russia. So I'm not sure that, uh, that Asian market, uh, it uh, offers a simple solution for, for Russian uh, state-owned uh, companies. If Europe, uh, hopefully at some, uh, uh, at some point in the future, decides to, you know, to, to, uh, to switch from uh, Russian energy sources, uh, I think it will be a, a great hit for, for Russian state-owned uh, uh, companies. So I'm not sure if Asia offers a viable solution just because of the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, Russian state-owned companies are very much embedded into Western, uh, uh, Western markets. Thanks, Rene. That's a really important um, economic and, and political perspective on this. Um, I also wanted to ask you because and, and this relates a little bit to Marietta's question in, in the Q&A. Um, so we're seeing this mass divestment, as you said, most of it's not responding to human rights. Um, when businesses are leaving Russia, what do you think they need to be thinking about in terms of their human rights impacts of leaving? And have you seen any good practices, um, anything that addresses this, this hostage law, which by the way, I did not realize that, like I, I knew that there was, um, an obligation to have personnel in Russia. I don't think I ever put together what Marietta says in the in the Q and A that mm. uh, it allows for companies employees to be taken hostage if they criticize the government. Deeply concerning. Are you seeing any business and human rights? Are you seeing anything that you think are, is a good model for other companies to follow when it comes to divestment here? Well, uh, I mean, generally, generally speaking. Uh, Companies, when they decide to disinvest, in, uh, disengage, of course, they have to consider their business relationship with uh, with uh, their suppliers, business partners in in a country. Of course, if a if a if a company has a product production sites in the, in the Russian Federation, it will be more difficult to uh, to disinvent, disinvest, and disengage. And we have seen this in the last few weeks that companies which uh, uh, which have factories on the ground, they have not decided uh, to, uh, to disinvest. So uh, business relationship, the nature of it, the, the, the scope of it is, is very important. But then of course, uh, you know, the question, uh, how does uh, business operation of particular company affect rights? You know, whether there are some reports that uh, Companies colliding with the, with the government, either the local or state um, state level, or whether the risk has increased since uh, uh, Russia's aggression on on uh, uh, Ukraine, whether companies' uh, uh, operation will uh, will uh, enhance, will uh, deepen this this uh, this risk. So these are these are generally you know, the issues the company has to has to consider. One of the best example, well, one of the you know, better examples uh, from the practice in the last few weeks is the is the response uh, of uh, pharmaceutical companies. If you look at Western pharmaceutical pharma companies, you will see that uh, none of them have decided to disinvest and uh, disengage. Uh, majority of them, majority of them uh, have decided you know to publish a statement. And explain uh, why they decided to stay. And uh, for example, if you look, look at the statement by Bayer or Novartis or Sanofi, uh, there you can read that those companies will uh, disengage with the uh, Russian market concerning marketing activities. They will not invest in that, but that they consider that uh, their products is they're still important to ensure health and safety uh, of population. So. Uh, those are the better practices. Of course, again, here uh, uh, I'm referring to companies from from uh, global north. There are quite few companies from uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, also involved in the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, uh, have gone silent since uh, February 24th, uh, as uh, nothing has happened on, uh, on the Russian market. Several of them, they have production sites in in the Russian Federation, I think it's important for those companies, you know, to stay to stay in Russia in order to 
you know, to uh, to provide the uh, Russian population with uh, with access to to, to medicines. Uh, uh, I would uh, I would disagree uh, with those who would say that uh, uh, big pharma uh, they have to in any case you know disengage disinvest from from Russian market. I think they still have uh, uh, important service to provide to to, to Russian uh, population. Uh, and again, as we always you know, reiterate, one has to uh, differentiate uh, the Russian people uh, um, and uh, Russian government. Yeah, I think that that's a really important point. And I think it answers one of the other questions that's within the chat about whether you're sanctioning Russian businesses because they're Russian and because they're from Putin or whether or not you're sanctioning them because of how they have related specifically to uh, propping up an aggressive government that's now that's now um, waging war on a, on a neighbor in violation of the UN Charter. And I think, um, I don't want to speak for everyone on our panel, but I think that there's a large agreement that you, you need the targeted sanctions that are not aimed at just harming people because they are Russian. Um, uh, thank you, Yerne. I'm going to bring in Mark as well, because I want to, I want to um, ask him a question and and Mark, I'm going to flip the order of the questions I was going to ask you. So apologies for that. Um, and your name, I'm going to remove your spotlight. Sorry. Um, so Mark, uh, because we we just had that comment on the bias, I want to um, go to the question about what it means to to have biased or discriminatory impacts from from what are actually business and human rights compliance pra practices and processes. Russia, in this situation, Russia is the one that's in breach very clearly of international law. There's obviously other concerns around Ukraine's conduct internally, but not at the same level. We're not talking about that same, that same issue. So Russian crime of aggression, uh, with the caveat, of course, that the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over that crime in this context. War crimes, um, seeming targeting of, of hospitals, at least, and civilian objects. So quite significant issues. And it would seem like a non-biased approach to business and human rights in this context will actually lead to sort of biased or discriminatory impacts because states and businesses will have to have a different response to Ukraine in terms of what speech is regulated or who, what, what weapons we sell them, what activities we take place on the territory of Ukraine versus what we do with Russia. Um, first, I just want to make sure that that's your understanding and what do you think businesses should be paying attention to in order to ensure that this is about a legitimate application of business and human rights principles and the law rather than a discriminatory application. Sorry, oh. I forgot to introduce you, Mark. Hello. Mark Taylor, by the way. Um, sorry, I was so excited to talk to you that I forgot to tell everybody else who okay. you are. Okay, don't worry about it. So, Mark is at the Clooney, Justice, Clooney Foundation for Justice. Is that... Am I getting it close? Uh, he was previously with FAFO in, in uh, Norway. I have to apologize to Mark because I have his book at my house, but I'm currently house sitting and forgot to pack it with me for this event. But he has a book out with CUP um, on war economies. I think it's with CUP. Yeah. So Mark, all right, sorry about that. And now tell us about discrimination and how we do this. <laughs> Thanks, Tara, and Thanks for inviting me. It's really good to see uh, so many of you um, again. Um, and uh, yeah, just to echo, it's really unfortunate that that um, this aggression is uh, against Ukraine is is what br brings us together. Um, so look on this question of discrimination, I would the short answer is kind of yeah, sure, but on on what basis? Um, what's the what are the what are the basis on which we discriminate? And so I think I would I would kind of respond to the question in two ways. Um, first, I would say that in relation to the application of business and human rights norms. It's important to keep in mind that discrimination is not a bad thing. Uh, in fact, the, the, the whole point of the norms that we have, the UNGPs, for example, is precisely that businesses should discriminate in who they do business with and, and, um, and to provide a normative basis, human rights standards and norms, uh, upon which to legit legitimately discriminate or legitimate to base their discrimination on, on those le legitimate norms. In respecting human rights, business has a duty to discriminate against human rights abuse. Um, due diligence is the process in which they should do so. And they should be doing so with respect to their business relationships, both with respect to supply chains that are either uh, entering war zones or coming from war zones. 
And we have to keep in mind that, that, that they are in fact going in both directions um, uh, or whether we're talking about foreign direct investment scenarios, uh, which Anita mentioned um, earlier, the scenario of companies actually operating in the, in the conflict zone um, and on all sides of the conflict uh, in Ukraine. So, um, and I think, you know, this is, this is uh, also true, by the way, of other um, legal regimes that regulate value chains, including, for exa example, sanctions law. And so that brings me to the kind of second part um, of my answer, which is that in the present situation in relation to Ukraine, businesses operating, and we've touched on this many times in the comments uh, so far, but just to kind of take us up a level to a bit of a macro level analysis, businesses operating in this environment of a sort of legal nexus or a kind of crossroads between human rights and humanitarian protections uh, of, in war on the one hand and national security on the other. And this is, of course, a divide that runs throughout international law, not just human rights law. Um, and this is particularly relevant for cases of business relationships with states. Um, in the present context, sectors like uh, finance, tech, uh, weapons, and oil and gas, just off the top of my head, would appear to be kind of the most um, prone to facing this, the, the regulatory dilemmas or the regulatory interventions that are gonna create these dilemmas uh, for, for these companies. So, you know, on the one hand, sanctions driven by a national security agenda, a form of, of economic warfare, um, and on the other hand, uh, human rights norms and standards that, that they also need to be uh, complying with. Um, so to a certain extent, the comments, you know, made earlier about, um, how to respect rights um, in withdrawing from conflict zones, you know, those are gonna to have to be applied in these kinds of situations when, when companies are, uh, you know, trying to manage uh, these, these dilemmas. For those of you familiar with, with um, the case of um, the Norwegian um, uh, telecom Telenor in the situation in Myanmar, you have a kind of classic situation that, was just one case, uh, but in this situation in Ukraine and Russia is gonna be replicated hundreds of thousands of, of, of times over. And we've touched on a few of those examples uh, already. So I just wanna add very briefly that, um, you know, these dilemmas arise from a much bigger structural shift that has been happening for several years now in global politics, away from norms of globalization that we in the business and human rights community are used to dealing with. That's our bread and butter. Um, but it's moving towards norms of geopolitics that we aren't used to dealing with. Um, it's been happening for several years, in particular as a result of the war on terror, and in particular unleashed by the Trump administration, but it's now dominant. And it means that this contradiction between rights of peoples and powers of states are gonna be filtered not always through the normative filter of, filter of global rights, including property rights that corporations want and human rights that, that affected communities want, but also through the filter of national security and therefore increasingly nationalist or nationally interested approaches to regulating global value chains. And of course, oligarchy is kind of the classic manifestation of that. Um, and it's something that is not just so it's something that Russia has to grapple with. It's something that Ukraine has had to grapple with and that we, of course, in the West are also having to grapple with. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. That was a really helpful uh, overview of what we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about these issues. Um, I also wanted, because your book on war economies covers kind of the big players within war economies, the financiers, the trade industry, um, I really wanted to seek your guidance on how the arms trade industry should be responding to this because um, the arms trade treaty for those who don't know requires states to do human rights due diligence before they allow for the export of weaponry um, not just the weapon as it's as it's solidified and in, in final product but also the components of weapons um, the arms trade treaty does not directly target businesses however uh, what we have in terms of what businesses are supposed to do really comes from the UN guiding principles. There has been some work, but not in my opinion, enough work trying to get the, the arms industry to really understand the guiding principles 
and what it expects of them. So from, from you, what, do, what should we be expecting of the arms industry? What do they need to be thinking about? What do their investors need to be thinking about uh, within this conflict? Yeah, so very briefly, you're quite right. I mean, uh, look, as um, uh, to fight a war, you need three things, property, weapons, labor, uh, fighters. And as um, Dr. Aparach was mentioning before, you know, money to acquire both and to maintain, sustain both over time. The ATT, the Arms Trade Treaty, regulates the first, um, namely conventional weapons, and it does so by combining a combination of international uh, legal norms, um, namely uh, national security in the form of export controls, weapons ex export controls at the national level, and humanitarian concerns, including human rights. And the ATT basically integrates uh, international humanitarian law and human rights norms to an export control regime. So even though it's called an ATT, an arms trade treaty, it's not exactly a, a trade treaty, but that's the, way it, that's the way it operates, at least from the perspective of, of how it might actually do some good with respect to the arms trade. And you're absolutely right. Um, uh, be, the, the big gap here was that uh, the drafters of the ATT missed the opportunity provided by the UN guiding principles to embed the statutory duty on the part of the arms industry. Um, for example, to conduct due diligence, um, um, and really only focus on the duties of, of states. So you have situations in which, you know, officials in ministries of foreign affairs, for example, um, are required to be doing the due diligence on behalf of global manufacturing company, uh, global arms manu manufacturers, which is kind of bizarre when you think about the, the division of labor here. So states have all the duties and, and states do all the work. And so, yes, there is a gap. I do just kind of more broadly on the way forward, at that level, I think, before I get onto the specifics about this situation, look, there, we are going to require regulation to fill that gap. And it would basically, obviously, consist of requiring arms exporters to provide state regulators with substantive due diligence as part of their application for a license to, to export. Um, plus, and I'm not suggesting self-regulation to fill this gap, yeah? Okay. That would have to be matched with um, penalties for when they fail to do that that effectively, um, and liability for arms companies in in uh, their home jurisdictions when they're involved in um, uh, providing weapons or the me or other means, dual use, etc., components related to you know that are used in international crimes abroad. Um, Mark, I'm going to let you apply this to the yeah. Ukraine crisis in a second right. and the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. But I also have to say, you're, you're giving states a lot of credit by saying they're doing the work because not all of them are well, of doing course. the work, right? Yeah, I'm not suggesting they're doing yeah, the work. Yeah, yeah. So I do, yeah. I do want to say to that, like, for the audience that, you know, the UK famously yeah. once said that they could rely on Saudi Arabia's self-assessment and investigation as to whether or not Saudi Arabia was engaged in war crimes and crimes against humanity um, and human rights violations within, within yeah, the Yemeni war. And thankfully, the court said, no, you can't. Like, you have an independent responsibility right. here. But unfortunately, we are not seeing, seeing that play out on the state level. So returning to the business in Ukraine, I'm going to let you answer that part here, Mark. Sorry. Well, so just, I mean, I think, so from the, um, I think the most obvious thing here is, um, in terms of a regulatory, I'll say two things. One is one is specific business responsibilities, um, and what they should be looking out for. I think the obvious thing here is is the the, the risk of complicity in international crimes, which uh, I hinted at um, before. And uh, you know, splitting those up, I think that there there is the potential here for um, now recognizing that in the situation with with Russia, a a privatized but nonetheless state dependent um, and export dependent uh, arms industry. So it's not dependent on, you know, on importing components from, from the West or, or from others, right? It's a largely an exporter of, of, uh, of weapons. Um, but that being said, uh, there is, the, there is the, the potential that states that aren't particularly happy um, about uh, aggression in the international system uh, might start to reconsider um, dealing with Russian arms producers that they might have dealt with uh, in, might have dealt with in the past, on on the grounds and to the extent to which this these um, arm producers 
um, are uh, complicit in, in the aggression. And of course, what I'm talking about here is not so much the states, but civil society in those states making this case to, uh, to their governments. The second one, I think more, just more generally is, is on both sides of this conflict is the risk of, of complicity in war crimes and crimes against humanity. And here, it, the, real import, the really important thing, I think, is, is the, um, the kinds of weapon systems and their use over time and the patterns of attacks against civilians that start to emerge. We're seeing a lot of coverage in um, the Western media of the so-called Russian playbook that was uh, developed in, uh, uh, over several different conflicts, whether, whether in Chechnya, Georgia, and most recently in Syria. And I think that um, that playbook has involved the use of uh, air power against uh, civilian targets, uh, something which you quite rightly point out um, or hinted at was also happening um, uh, with Western uh, weapons in, for example, Yemen by the Saudis and, and UAE. So it's not necessarily just a Russian playbook we're looking at here. They are different, of course, but uh, the, these dynamics and the potential for liabilities arise in, in both of these um, situations. I do think there's a there's an element here of um, of um, risk for the tech sector with respect to the weaponization of social media, and that raises the whole question of dual use in general. So you know, pharmaceutical companies, etc., still operating. Um, all of the risks around uh, chemical weapons production um, uh, and all of that kind of all of that kind of stuff, which we have seen play out in places, for example, um, like Syria, where components of dual use, whether it's um, ammonium nitrate for uh, fertilizer uh, being used in the production of barrel bombs or um, pharmaceutical uh, chemicals being used uh, in the production of uh, of chemical weapons. So. There are a number of different um, uh, sectors that are going to have to be paying attention to uh, the end use of their um, uh, materials, uh, as well as um, hopefully states that are that are opposed to aggression starting to think about um, the the sources of their uh, weapons pur purchases. Thanks, Mark. That's really helpful. Um, I. I'm now going to move from the arms trade into some of the other kinds of actors that we've been seeing on the ground in Crimea in particular. So for that, I'm gonna bring in Peter Webster um, and let's see if I can do this. Um, Peter is the CEO of the IRS Foundation and Peter has been in the field of business and human rights and looking at um, ESG uh, and ethical investment for um, since the foundation, since the beginning of the Iris Foundation. I'm not gonna say when that was, Peter, um, but it's been for a couple of decades. Uh, um, and the Iris Foundation is one of my favorite NGOs who've been working on situations of armed conflict for a long time. Um, that includes developing databases around corporations and businesses that are operating in um, situations of occupation. So that includes a database on the OBT and also one on occupied Crimea. So Peter, I wanted to ask you, uh, what kinds of businesses have been operating within Crimea and what lessons do it, or what lessons can we draw from the experience in Crimea uh, to the current situation within Ukraine? So thanks, Tara. I'll do my best. Uh, so the, the particular project you're referencing was, um, was, was done mainly between 2015 and about 2020. Um, so we're obviously urgently looking at whether we should be updating it now in the current context. But what we did in Crimea was to look at all the economic activity we could find, um, identify links to parent companies or listed companies from, from those entities. And then we classified things into three types. We had one that we called annexed, um, we have one that we called open and one that we call closed. So the annexed companies were the ones where the assets were simply taken by the administration in Crimea. So the ports, the banks, the defense related companies, construction companies, railway, gas, power, telecoms, and so forth, um, were simply taken over and, and became state assets, or in some cases were re passed on to others, like the banks were all split up and passed on to Russian banks. Um, so there was that group of economic activity that was just taken by the new administration. 
There was the closed group, which were the businesses that stopped. So um, a bit like now you had some businesses, McDonald's, Apple, for example, um, announcing that they were not going to operate anymore in some cases because of the sanctions that were being brought in quite firmly. Um, Mercedes-Benz was an example of someone who, who stopped dealerships selling cars. Um, some others pulled out of tourism-related services. So there was a group of businesses that disengaged from Crimea. And then we have the open group, which are half of them are Russian companies. So some of them being the beneficiaries of assets taken from others and given to them, um, but other Russian businesses of one sort or another. Um, some of those had international partners who were investing in them as Russian businesses in some way. Um, and some of the continuing non-Russian involvement was also through um, investors in private equity schemes or other things that were trying to invest in a complicated situation, should we say. Um, there were quite a few, there's quite a few cases of cars still being available for sale, sports goods, still branded goods. In some cases, the company is saying that they weren't allowing this or it was happening without their consent. Um, supermarkets still with some operation from outside, some Ukrainian businesses who passed their assets to local management in the hope of maintaining some sort of smooth transition. So you were saying, what, what's the relevance of all that to the current situation? Obviously, it's a bit difficult to know because one doesn't know, one hopes this all comes to an end soon and we don't know what the peace deal looks like. So, you know, whether there will be similar things going on in other parts of uh, Ukraine as happened in, in Crimea. But I suppose I'd say one of the things is that the ESG investor community didn't play a huge role in any of this. They tended to look at it, I think, as being something for sanctions and compliance, not, not something for voluntary action. Um, now, clearly, the scale of action by all sorts of players is, is getting well beyond what's been sanctioned by governments. So there's a lot of voluntary sanctions, if you like, happening in the business and the ESG community. And that means that the responsibility for how that's being done clearly rests with the people who are doing it. Um, so all the points that have been made previously in this seminar are, are totally valid. I mean, I think, you know, sanctions as a punishment has a very tricky history. Um, sanctions aimed at the economy in general to weaken the power of Russia to maintain the war are obviously indiscriminate. Um, so I think things like trying to be very clear about the purpose of divestment and sanctions. I also think you've mentioned a long history in this field. I mean, looking at a variety of different sanctions and situations, it is important to think about the reverse gear when you're doing these things. Um, and also to think about what transitional arrangements you might end up with. So with Sudan, which we also do work on, there was you know, a careful plan to make sure that the, the actions people took would come to an end when the sanctions ended. But the way they ended was more complicated than people had imagined. And there wasn't enough thought about the transitional situation that might arise, um, even before the coup that's now pushed that in the wrong direction. Um, so in the present situation, I mean, you can see the huge value if Russian companies can raise in Russia uh, criticism of what's going on. Uh, Luke Oil, I don't know what's happened since they made their first announcements, but Luke Oil came out against it. I think that's a really useful thing to see. Um, and so investors who are selling their shares and, and heading for the hills should at least be communicating clearly to those they're selling why they're doing this and what would make them return because probably their actions are being explained internally as just part of an American plot to destroy Russia. And if actually it's a response to the huge horror of all their stakeholders and constituents at, at aggression, it would be much better to explain that clearly to the people that you're, you're departing from. Um, and longer term, it was very interesting what Mark was saying about like how this is all getting into geopolitics rather than human rights norms. I mean, it's the, the thing is, we tend to look at businesses in terms of site specific things or product or client specific things that they might get involved in. But this is raising questions about the role of business in generating wealth or creating economic models that then get used to bankroll aggression or war crimes. And it's a, it's a pity to have a binary answer to that. I think we need to think what sorts of business models, what sorts of economic activity tend to lead to bad outcomes. Um, and, and what sorts of things tend to overcome uh, past crimes and things and work out how we can be saying in business and human rights that you know, the businesses should get themselves on the right side of that, that divide. But it's a bit like, I, I think of it like the site and product specific thing, if you take an environmental equivalent, is like, like water pollution. 
Um, but the role of business in, in creating economic models of generating wealth is more like a climate change type problem, that you're all contributing in tiny ways. And it's very difficult to see all the links and to be really clear what's the most uh, constructive thing to do. So I hope that's some help or at least a different perspective. And I think it's been the brilliant perspectives um, that we've heard. And it will certainly help people like me trying to think what can responsible investors best do in this situation to take away everything that everyone said today. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I just want to ask you one more question regarding what you've seen, because you noted that that you looked at parent companies and their relationships um, and that this has turned into a sort of geopolitical uh, sanctions led approach to dealing with what is um, for many of us not a geopolitical issue, but really one that, that we would like to see applied equally, whether it's to Russia or, or to Saudi Arabia or to the United States. Um, so have you seen any good practices amongst home states in regards to giving advice to businesses operating in Crimea or giving advice to businesses operating in the OPT that they could, that, that states could use now to help advise companies as to what they should be doing um, from a human rights lens? Yeah, so I mean, the OPT example, there were clearly examples of Russian foreign minister, not Russian, uh, EU foreign ministers acting in concert to put out messages about the human rights issues around property rights, say, and saying, look, there is contested rights over some of the things that you're going to be using if you operate in, in the OPT or particularly in the settlements. And, you know, you can't be too sure that those assets will remain yours when a resolution of those problems is reached because there are, there are property rights issues as human rights issues. So there, there were cases where, yeah, where um, home states were putting out messages to their companies like that. I'm not sure, I, I mean, it's, I'm not saying that there weren't any in relation to Crimea, it's not really something we've looked for. So there may have been advice being given. There's certainly been advice being given to companies by governments now as to what they should do. Um, and I mean, we heard of the business secretary having a 20 minute meeting with BP before they announced their decision to to leave and some of the details of what was said at that and the previous meeting kind of came out but so they, they are clearly but I think it's it's very heavily at the moment in in concert with the 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 other activities of the government obviously to try and um, sanction Russia and to try and create incentives for them to stop stop the aggression rather than thinking carefully about a business and human rights and, and particularly the points you've made already about like think of the consequences on the other people. If you don't want this to come across as a war on the Russian people, take every opportunity to make sure that businesses are not treating it as a war on the Russian people, because you know people are gonna remember these things. Yeah, I agree. Um, thanks, Peter. That's a nice way to, to wrap up the, the um, initial round of, of discussion. I'm going to ask actually for all of the uh, speakers to, and I'm going to remove my spotlight here. I'm going to ask for all of the speakers to um, turn your cameras on. We're going to do a quick round. We're down to about 18 minutes. I do want to be respectful of time um, because I know that you've all given up a lot to be here. Um, but I would like to do a quick round. Some of you have already indicated some of the questions you'd like to answer. Um, Elena, I'm going to save you for the very last person. You're going to wrap us up in the end, because um, I think I think it's right that you're you get the final word out of all the words. Um, I am going to note a few things before we go into the final rounds of statements. Um, first is that we are trying to look into setting up a fund that would support the business and human rights community within Ukraine. Details of that are pending. Um, but we are looking specifically at how to support people like Elena, um, our friends from the Belarusian Helsinki Committee who have been um, working out of Ukraine and are, are now in exile again, um, having already had to flee from, from Belarus, and others that are working within, within Ukraine on business and human rights. So we are looking at how we can set up a fund to support some of that. Uh, those of you who have registered for the event will get an email when we when we know more details about that. We are having another event on this, and uh, and we will also circulate details to everyone who registered for this event about that. Um, 
And then I'm just gonna, because I want Elena to truly have the last word, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who helped uh, or who showed up today. We, we have a, a significant showing today and a significant number of you have stuck around to the very end. I also wanna thank Sophie Conlin, who is my colleague in the School of Law and Human Rights Center at the University of Essex and does our events and communications work and has been instrumental in making today work. Um, and I also want to uh, thank one of my student workers, Long De Yu, who is um, an LLM, no, nope, MA student this year, sorry, Long De, um, an MA student this year, um, and has been really helpful in keeping me on task because I've been a little under the weather and a little overworked. Um, and so Long De has made sure that this has come together. So thank you to both Sophie and Long De. So now for the final round, um, I'm going to start with you, Anita. Um, you marked a few questions that you'd like to answer. Um, I think maybe just the one in terms of, do you think it's fair for us to sanction Russian businesses? But I'd also like to bring in Rachel's question to you and Robert's question. So do you think due diligence financial institutions have put in place in order to comply with the sanctions is being connected to the human rights due diligence that their financial institutions are doing? And if not, what can we do to encourage that? And do you have any examples of the reasons which companies have given, sorry, have any of the companies that you've looked at so far referred to human rights or similar reasons within, within, their, um, within their statements? And I'll let you also say whatever you would like to say about okay, No, I'll be very brief to give time for everybody else. Just a couple of reflections. One on the broader point, but I think you've heard from many others, including Peter and Yerne. The concept is we want to see more of a business and human rights approach to how companies are making the decisions that they're making with respect to the larger conflict. And we haven't seen that both in terms of their public views. There's a role under pillar one for states to be providing that guidance, both in the area of sanctions compliance, but more generally through a BHR lens. So that's a message back to states and then a message back to companies to really think about their strategies. And I think Peter ended very eloquently on that point, which is that, you know, again, you think need to think about as you exit or engage uh, that what are the impacts on all people uh, uh, in terms of, of these issues. So Russian people, Ukrainian people, uh, how, how do you do that and do that well? To the more specific points, the larger issue around financial institutions, point one, anti-corruption due diligence around politically exposed persons is human rights due diligence, right? That's one of the other things the working group has emphasized is connecting these agendas and the way in which financial institutions think about whose assets they hold and who they do business with is intrinsically a human rights issue. So that's point one. Second point is that we need to develop mechanisms that tie these things together, not necessarily in terms of processes, but as we screen for issues relating to suspicion of corruption, money laundering, and economic crime, we can create similar screens when there are account holders or other clients that have connections to ser serious human rights abuses, right? That, that we need to do both in terms of who our customers are. So that is what we need to do. And, and now that we have those clients in place, that due diligence, if it wasn't done immediately, needs to be done now. And this is the problem that we have. So I'll end there to say, I really learned a lot from the other panelists in terms of thinking these, these nuanced and, and difficult issues uh, through. Did we lose Tara? I think we did. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did, yeah. So I'm just I think gonna, um, send her an email now. Bear with me. Okay, so Yelena, maybe over to you. <laughs> All right, I'll take over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just reply uh, quickly on two questions that uh, I'll combine a few questions in, in to, to be very short and then just add something that I think is very important. Um, on the issue of companies or on the actors that are not legally registered, such as Wagner Group, we have identified Wagner Group operating, for example, in Syria or in Central African Republic that are trying to be attached to the companies that are locally registered, like for example, Aeropolis in Northern Syria operating uh, as a private security provider or in Central African Republic to the company that's called Loba Invest, which is extractive company or Seva Security, which is a private security company. So they seem to find their legitimacy through the, through the legally registered companies, but, but, but under national law. 
uh, and also in terms of the, 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 the legislation and, and, and applicable uh, framework, as I said, international humanitarian law applies to the companies and whenever they violate that law, that could be hold, uh, well, uh, they could be hold criminally liable, except we are missing on the, on the international jurisdiction, but the directors could be hold criminally liable before the International Criminal Court if all the other uh, conditions are met. And of course, there are some guidance that can be helpful and international committee of the Red Cross that has the authority over legal framework in, in, in armed conflicts has also uh, put uh, guidelines for uh, business in, in armed conflicts. So that's a very useful tool. Um, on the on the question of arms industry, uh, I'd like to point out that it has been, and that's ever since Nuremberg trials, that arms industry, while they may be situated somewhere uh, far from the conflict, if they contribute to the crimes, uh, then they could be uh, complicit in those crimes. Um, and also, uh, it's not human rights per se, but as Anita mentioned, we already have very strong legal frameworks in domestic uh, criminal legislation on corruption, on anti-laundering, etc., which applies to companies which they have to comply with at all times, including in armed conflicts as well. And I'd just like to finish on something that I think is very important from our uh, point of view, from the working group on, on the use of mercenaries, is how what is the role of businesses in the post-conflict uh, setting? And it also uh, aligns with the article that I'm, I proposed for on the, the lessons learned from the former Yugoslavia in terms of the combatants. And, and Tara, you asked all these actors that are combatants in different roles, mercenaries, foreign fighters, PMCs. Well, uh, wars do create that, uh, that element, or, but there are lots of actors, armed actors, that are very present in the conflict. And when the conflict ends, when the hostilities end, there is a big question, what do we do with that? And then socioeconomic, aspects are extremely important and the roles of com companies to integrate them into the normal life is extremely important. Otherwise, we find ourselves with the, with the situation where those uh, fighters, combatants, continue to operate in different conflicts abroad on the international, if I can call it, market of combatants between uh, flipping from Syria, Central African Republic uh, and Libya and other places. So the role of companies in the post-conflict is also very important. Thank you. Thanks, Jelena, and apologies for having dropped out. Um, I'm going to note that because I dropped out, I also lost all of the question and answer view. So I'm just going to hope that you guys all know what you want to answer um, and, and ask you to sort of stick to about two, two minutes or so. So Beata, I'm going to come to you now. Many thanks, Sarah. And I did, uh, Tara, um, apologies. I did respond to a couple of questions um, on, uh, in writing. So perhaps I would just want to add um, two more reflections as to the current situation. Because what we have observed in Poland is that, yes, on the one hand, we do have companies that help their own employees, or even when kind of, you know, just offering some additional financial support, offering some paid leave, all those things which you can probably read about. But we also see situations where companies, um, where men are going back to Ukraine to fight, that those companies are actually organizing relocation of their families to Poland and trying to adjust their working places, kind of to adjust kind of according to the health and safety, um, to the health and safety regulations to the women's needs. So that in a way, there is some sort of sustenance if, you know, if the um, work allows it. Uh, so it's actually very interesting to see how companies are reacting in a very, in a way that also engages in the business and human rights, um, kind of, uh, that goes into the business and human rights and not just into the donation and philanthropy. But it's also, I think, interesting to see that those companies that kind of went uh, with donations, but also with some practical in-kind um, assistance into the humanitarian aid kind of area and uh, started to provide assistance even if it's not within their, um, I would say, normal um, sphere of activity because we see, for example, some insurance companies, for example, providing some additional um, funding, organizing different um, services and so on. 
And now something which kind of was more of the CSR and philanthropy kind of turns into very essential service to those people who rely on it. And it's also kind of with regards to those companies that offer free of charge services and so on. So the question is, do they now have to conduct some sort of stronger due diligence when kind of trying to go back to their normal work and kind of trying to withdraw from kind of stepping literally into the state's shoes because it should be the state that provides a number of those services, but because it was unable to, they took over. So what should we expect of them now in this situation? Can they just kind of leave or, you know, what sort of activity, what they, how they should react, what they should do? How the due diligence um, from withdrawing from providing humanitarian aid look like? So just kind of more raising a question rather than uh, answering it. Thanks. One that I hope we will get back to at some point because that's a really important set of questions. Uh, Yerne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, there are many challenges to, to this investment and this engagement. Beata mentioned a few, Chloe also mentioned uh, some in the, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, of course, uh, one of the issues here is uh, what can we expect from uh, state-owned companies? Uh, of course, uh, state should lead by example, you know, when they control uh, companies uh, where they have capital investment and uh, in this discussion on business human rights in Russia following you know, aggression, perhaps uh, uh, there, is a, there is discussion missing on the role of uh, you know, Russian state-owned companies, uh, particularly Gazprom, uh, Rusnet, and local Sperbank, the largest uh, Russian, Russian corporations. And of course, Russia has uh, very clear obligations to to protect uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, of individuals against uh, business-related abuses, uh, to put mechanisms uh, in place. Unfortunately, as we have found with Olena and and uh, Beat, uh, there is a systematic and general pattern across uh, most of Eastern uh, European countries that uh, governments uh, do not really control. You know, state-owned companies uh, as far. Uh, uh, human rights protection is um, uh, is concerned, and this is quite worrying. Also, if you ask ourselves, what will be the long-lasting consequences of this uh, of these uh, changes in the last uh, three weeks uh, about this investment, this investment, and this this engagement, whether there will be any long-lasting, uh, you know, consequences of uh, this aggression for our field of uh, of uh, business human rights? Um, so far, not. Uh, not very, very much convinced. I think uh, first states have to, you know, uh, take their obligations seriously and not, you know, turn blind eye to, to violations. Their companies, you know, uh, companies which they control are uh, committing or their complicit in uh, in human rights uh, violations. I think this is really important. Not only to focus, of course, we have to focus on Western companies uh, from uh, from our region, from global north, but then of course state-owned companies, uh, which still at this, at this moment when the Russian Federation is bombing, you know, the Ukrainian city, cities are, uh, you know, distributing gas uh, and oil to, to Central European uh, markets. I think it's quite, uh, it's, a, it's a situation which uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to grasp uh, for, uh, for populations, for people in, uh, in, in, in Europe. And of course, those companies, uh, they have obligations to address that. And as far as I have researched uh, in the last days, uh, uh, some of the websites of, for example, Gazprom and Rusnet, they're not available since several days. They're not uh, accessible. Uh, but uh, as, far, as far as I have seen, none of the Russian state-owned companies have pronounced uh, themselves uh, on, uh, on aggression, on human rights uh, relations. And uh, I think this is also quite important you know, um, step to take for, uh, for Russian Federation. Uh, thanks, Rene. Mark? I don't know what I want to answer. Maybe on sanctions, thinking again about this sanctions and human rights aspect. You know, sanctions do, do, um, uh, do, do several things. Um, they do three things in particular. You know, they, uh, in particular in this conflict, they are being used uh, as a way to end our complicity 
in an aggression against Ukraine uh, by Russia, in particular with respect to looking at how we scale back our purchases of uh, Russian oil and gas, which is used to finance the Russian war machine. And that I think is something where, um, which makes perfect sense. But we are also in the midst of a kind of sanctions frenzy. And I think that's been reflected in the discussion that we've, that we've had today, where um, this question of, you know, uh, what companies stay, what companies go, um, and, and the, 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 the reasons, the, the, um, the basis on which they justify their decisions to, to stay or go. And I think we need to think about, start now to start thinking about the ways in which the human rights standards that we know from the business and human rights community uh, can be used as part of the process going forward, in particular, the peace process and thinking about ways that we walk back the sanctions and use human rights criteria, business and human rights criteria um, uh, as a replacement for sanctions um, as, a, as, a, as we come back from, uh, from imposing these sanctions. In other words, requiring companies to implement these standards in order to justify their re-engagement in Russia or their re-engagement uh, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and secondly, that we think about it um, in terms of the, the aftermath of this conflict and, and the point about the um, post-conflict transition uh, that was raised uh, and how important um, human rights standards are going to be in, in, um, in, in that phase. So maybe there is a way to think constructively about, at least in relation to sanctions, um, about the place we are now and how we move uh, forward uh, from here in the context of, of uh, political um, resolution uh, to, to what's happening. Thanks, Mark. Peter? Um, just a tiny thought, left field slightly. I mean, I've been on calls recently where people have really stressed the importance of having women fully involved in the peace negotiations and how you get so much better results um, to the post-conflict situation, if only we can get there. I mean, it, like, it feels weird to be discussing this, given the horrors that people are going through right now. But um, like that just seems to be a much better way to do things. And yet I've also, on the same calls, people have been saying how amazingly excluded women often are in those final talks and giving chains of examples and business does know about this actually business has worked out that diverse boards are better than than old white men and you know they, they would be a bit appalled at some of what apparently happens in the international negotiations where you've got a team of brilliant women in the room next door while negotiations are going on in some cases so yeah maybe that's just something that business can Bring. And I think Jelena was making the point about the competence afterwards, but also just the trauma that, you know, what is the bus business's role of helping people recognize all that's happened, you know, respect all that's happened, see all the pain everywhere and all that kind of stuff. There may be opportunities. I remember hearing Anita, I think you'll know this in the Colombian situation where businesses got involved in kind of memory projects just to respect all the terrible things that had happened and make sure they weren't forgotten and they were thought about in a in a helpful sort of way. Thanks, Peter, that's helpful. And as we speak about women leaders' voices who we should listen to a lot more and who should be at the table, Olena, what do you wanna say for, as, at the, as the end? First of all, thank you all, of course. Uh, and actually, if we are talking about the role of women, my first reaction um, on the um, on the delegations from Russia and Ukraine, we know that uh, we have the navigation process now. Uh, was uh, why uh, any women? Uh, we have not any women in both delegations. Uh, any Ukrainian women and any Russian women? No, it's uh, about state uh, negotiations. Of course. Um, as for today' topic. Um, I, I, I can't say, say any new thing. Uh, I, I just want to mention that uh, that companies in Ukraine 
uh, which uh, already have uh, human rights capacities, uh, they react very differently uh, today. And we see that, again, for example, uh, members uh, of European Business Association uh, uh, who build their human rights capacities, uh, uh, they react um, responsible uh, on this conflict and they they are really trying to support uh, employees and uh, other um, people who are, uh, who are affected by uh, by the war. And um, it, uh, of course, uh, it, it, it would be perfect to be prepared to any challenges that we have. But uh, for future, we should learn this lesson that if uh, companies uh, uh, build such capacities, uh, it could be uh, really important uh, for society uh, who has such challenges as we today. Thanks, Elena. That's a perfect way to end. Um, thank you all for coming to this and um, for some important reflections. Elena, stay safe and stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>